All right, we are live. So I'll, I'll go ahead and welcome us this morning. I'm uh, Tristan Tolino, and I haven't changed my name um, on the screen, but I'm a representative from Brattleboro, along with Molly and Emily, where the three of us represent this community in the Vermont House. And we've been hosting now for what seems like two or three months, uh, a weekly drop-in uh, roundtable conversation uh, with um, the community, for the community, uh, and sharing it with the community through BCTV. And some of our stalwarts are here on a lovely uh, holiday Saturday morning. And we just had a little pre-conversation about a couple of topics. Usually we start with a quick um, round, you know, round robin of uh, the legislators giving any relevant updates. And then we take questions or organize around a topic. And I know we are intending to organ organize around a conversation around homelessness and what's going on in the COVID uh, pandemic response uh, around homelessness, and that will be a major theme. Um, but first, I wanted to pitch it to Emily and Molly to see if there's any quick updates that they have uh, to offer around the work that's happened in the last week uh, in the legislature. And Emily, why don't you go this first this time? Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. On this, it really is a glorious Saturday morning, and the rain, sleeping with the rain and the windows open was really just just what I needed. Um, so last week, this week, the week that just finished, we um, saw the passage through the Senate of the bill that allows the Brattleboro Select Board to set tax rates for the next fiscal year pending a vote. Um, and so that's on its way to the governor's desk and um, I guess perhaps I shouldn't assume he's gonna sign it, but I haven't heard any indications <laughs> otherwise about it, um, it seems. And so that's great, very excited about that because that allows Brattleboro to continue on with its work. Um, we are the only town that was in that situation and so we're able to get um, a bill through both bodies that really focus on that town and focused on our needs specifically. And I'm grateful to our House colleagues for passing it unanimously and really grateful to our senators, Senator White and Ballant for the great work they did to move it across their body. It was slightly more complicated on that side. Um, and yes, so that's property taxes for the town so that they can, essentially they can um, confirm the budget for next year and then set property taxes based on that. And it's a, just to add one element, it, there's a, Brattleboro specific nature to it because of our unusual governance structure. That's why we need a fix and why this isn't being perceived as a huge problem statewide. We're the only town in the state that has a representative town meeting. And though towns over 5,000 have the right to do that, nobody has done it. Um, um, can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. um, Last week, I thought that you had said, and I'm wondering if I misunderstood what I heard last week because of what you just said here, mm -hmm. that, um, that the, there was a bill in the Senate to allow the select board to decide the budget for the year. This is what you're saying is that this allows the town to, the, the select board to set the property taxes. Those two things are two different things, right? Um, so in the town charter and, um, the town can only set the tax rate a certain number of days after the budget is approved um, and based on the budget. And so it sort of starts that cascading series of um, charter effects. And so the, it's more important that the town be able to set a tax rate than that the town be able to set a budget, but it has to start with the town setting a budget. Can someone help me explain that with other words? <laughs> well, I think that the explanation made some sense, but what didn't make sense is, um, are there two separate mechanisms? I think the question is, are there two separate mechanisms, one for passing the budget, which we talked about last week, and one for passing a tax rate? Oh, no, it's the you, same bill. It's in, They're both within the same yeah. bill. And so we just highlighted a different feature of the same bill this week. They needed the authority. Okay, so that means that the the select board is going to pass be passing the budget for the year. Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to speak for the select board, but the select board now has the ability to pass the budget for the year. Okay. My understanding is that they're interested in passing a temporary budget that will then be revoted on whenever they see fit. And perhaps our select board member is interested in weighing in on that. Yeah, I definitely don't want to speak for the entire select board. <laughs> and I, you know, this is where I'm like, Peter, sit next to me and tell me exactly what is factual. Um, <laughs> my, my understanding, uh, such as it is, is that we will be able to set the tax rate um, and that's how we'll pay for the stuff and then later on in the summer our plan is to still hold a representative town meeting when it is safe to do so that's that's what we're planning right now thanks in further tax issues affecting the town of brattleboro and our inability mm -hmm. to carry out a regular vote in our regular timeline. Um, we are still working through and having many conversations about what it's gonna look like to set school budgets. We are one of a number of towns um, and districts that don't have a approved school budget yet. And so we are working through conversations between the House and the Senate on what can be done about that. Meanwhile, schools and school districts throughout the state are moving forward with vote by mail provisions um, in order to continue to move the conversation along to get school budgets approved. And so I believe that our school district is having a, um, is starting a voting process and will be um, heavily vote by mail, but people are still going to be able to go to their town clerk's offices and vote in person safely if that is their preference. Oh. Bob. I think Bob has some. Can't hear you, Bob. Oh, I'm mute. You're not muted though. It seems like you're just not disconnected, you're not connected to the sound. I think we should have some point we should have a one-on-one -on -one zoom call to fix all the things because i miss your voice in these meetings hi mary so i'm gonna ah oh the polling place will be at the windham southeast school oh. district offices thank you bob um, and then other places throughout the district that are not in Brattleboro will be in other places soon to be announced. And there will be a postcard mailed to every, um, probably every resident explaining all of this to them. So you don't need to depend on us to tell you the details there. Um, there will be much publicity. So that's what's happening with property taxes. Um, there are, just wanna continue to reassure people that it is the full intent of the Ways and Means Committee and um, therefore the House to not um, backfill the Ed Fund with property taxes, meaning we're really interested and committed to keeping property taxes stable, similar to last year, perhaps a tiny mm. fluctuation up or down, but that we are, in, we are committed to making sure that we solve the problems of the state through a mechanism other than property taxes. Because we do have a revenue shortfall because of meals right. and rooms taxes um, not coming in and sales taxes not coming in at the same levels that we predicted, but um, are looking at a way of raising revenue other than property taxes for that. It does not, um, property taxes are based um, on income calculations from the previous year. And so they are not very sensitive to people's income fluctuations. And if someone, and they are not due to the state, they are due to towns who then sends them to the state right now. And so if there is any um, shortfall in property, in people actually paying their property taxes, that is, that sits in the relationship between towns and taxpayers, not between the state and taxpayers. And so we are looking for some mechanisms to support towns who might be grappling with that issue. Um, but yeah, and that's the, that's the answer to that question. Daniel, a question. I just saw two questions in the chat about um, whether or not there's been a shortfall in property tax um, collections. And so the fourth quarter property taxes for last year just passed. And we, the collections that we'd received at the 
my last select board meeting were um, basically normal um, or close enough to normal. Um, there's still a little bit of, you know, um, finalizing on that. You know, some of the texts is, came in by mail and it just takes a little bit longer, but there wasn't any huge gap. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to see, I think the financial struggles that people are facing are going to have a longer tail um, than I think some people predicted. Um, and it's going to be sort of a longer, slower tail. And so that gives us an opportunity to look for different solutions to it. Um, and possibly even an opportunity to prevent some of that. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about housing in the meeting. Um, I think that's the bulk of my exciting updates from the State House for this week. Molly. Okay, well, I've been deep into the work of the Transportation Committee this week. We, we worked very many hours on uh, sort of changing uh, we, we passed a transportation bill on March 12th uh, and H942 and it went to the went to the house got sent to appropriations it passed out of appropriations on March 13th that was the day we all we all left and so it was sort of hanging there uh, on the calendar and um, given new realities we had to deal with a different landscape so I think this sort of illustrates, you know, the, the issues of, of what happens when uh, in this kind of situation. So the administration came back and sort of stripped down the bill and said, we just, we don't want to have any conflict with the Senate. We just want to do things that are very uh, easy and, you know, give us the authority to spend the money and all this. And we were sort of like, well, not exactly, because we had a lot of priorities in there, climate priorities that were really, really important to the committee. Uh, things around money for public transit and money for the electric vehicle incentive program that started last year. And so we um, thrashed this out and and uh, one one of my colleagues, Mike um, McCarthy, came up with a sort of substitute amendment. And we worked through uh, with a lot of consensus, even among the conservative members of, of our committee, to put in some safeguards so that if we get federal stimulus, if we get a, a federal stimulus infrastructure bill, which may happen later, that um, the we're sort of um, directing the agency to spend money on plug-in electric hybrid buses and uh, the electric vehicle incentive program, things that will deal with cutting our transportation emissions. And you probably have heard this figure many times, but transportation accounts for like somewhere between 43 and 40 percent of Vermont's 47 percent of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions so we have been struggling for a number of years I have been to sort of how do you cut that number and now of course it's it's being cut for us because people aren't driving and and that also means that the transportation fund is down because we're not collecting money from gas tax so anyway so I guess what I just want to say is that that um, we we came to a pretty a pretty good resolution of this issue, um, partly because the administration, the face of the administration in transportation, is a person named Michelle Boomhauer, who's basically really sympathetic to the things that we want to do, but she's sort of always treading a fine line. So it, it's a little bit it's a little bit easier um, working with, I think, you know, based on what I know about you know the other kind of conflicts that happen with the other, you know, in, in the, with the governor's office. Uh, anyway, so without getting too specific, we made our priorities known. And another really cool thing that we did was we had had in our bill a program called transport to look at transportation demand management and transportation demand management is something like they're doing it at UVM uh, because they don't have enough parking. So they give incentives to people who are going to ride their bikes to campus or who are going to not use cars, they give free bus passes, et cetera. So we had a study in our, um, or a, a, pro a pilot project in our original bill to have the Agency of Transportation work with a couple of, of employers 
to see about instituting some kind of a transportation demand management program. Like the retreat would have been a really good candidate or Brattleboro Hospital, somebody who's a big employer who could actually cut. Well, now that, you know, the landscape again, people are, are staying at home. So this got transitioned into a study to look at the impact of telecommuting on, on emissions. And uh, well, on the on vehicle miles traveled, on how many how many what's the what's the amount of vehicle miles traveled, and then correspondingly the um, the greenhouse gas emissions, and what what has been the effect of that from during the pandemic, and what are the possibilities for the future? So that was a really pretty um, pretty neat, uh, I think, sort of pivot that makes sense in these times, and sort of getting again to the issue of how do we cut emissions from transportation. Uh, so of course that bill just got voted out of committee yesterday. It will get, um, I'm not sure because it's, it's already there on the, on the notice calendar. I don't think what, I'm not sure it has to go back to appropriations because there's no real change in the money part of it. Anyway, it has to go get through the Senate, which is another another hurdle because the Senate Transportation Committee is chaired by um, somebody who has a lot of power. And uh, anyway, we'll see where it goes. But it was a really good process. And uh, even given the limitations of Zoom, I think that uh, the, the committee, committee worked really, really well together. And so it's just very heartening to, to see the that kind of thing and dealing with a challenge and trying to compromise but not give up on your on your uh, initiatives. So I think that's that's all I want to say right now. Molly, there was a question that came in. Is there support for electric bikes? Uh, interesting. I had a bill this year to give um, an incentive to electric bicycles because I took advantage of that Green Mountain Power incentive last year, that $200, and bought myself one. And um, so I had a, a bill to, to add on to the electric vehicle incentive program, a program for electric bikes. And it was really limited. It was like the first 200 electric bikes. I mean, it was like $50,000 or something, but it didn't fly in committee this year, partly because um, uh, there was a, a lot of talk about how <laughs> Green Mountain Power has an incentive. And a number of the different electric utilities uh, have those incentives for their customers. So it was, you know, it's just something that I, I, I sort of gave up on for the moment. But um, if I'm back there next year, which I hope to be, I will press for because I think it's a, a really great solution for a lot of people. And of course, we know how well Dave Cohen has has promoted this in Brattleboro and, you know, has really gotten people excited about it. And so anyway. So I guess I could say among some members of my committee, there is support, but it wasn't something worth, um, there were other things to fight for. So I know Dave was upset, but it'll come back. Um, all right, I will offer just uh, two quick updates, I think, and then we can see where where the conversation goes. As Emily said, the, the economic recovery package is also tied in with the housing sort of housing homelessness question. So uh, this may be a good pivot into that topic that was raised before we started recording about uh, a topic of interest to at least a couple of people. Um, so the, the two updates, one, uh, last week we talked about the uh, hazard pay bill and whether that was gonna move forward or not. I would say now having had the governor announce uh, his ideas for uh, an economic recovery package and um, I'll explain more details on that in a second. I, I do think that there's a, a way in which the hazard pay uh, conversation may happen within the context of the whole economic recovery package rather than as a standalone concept. Uh, so we'll see whether that whether we find a way to balance the, the resources that are being um, suggested for a whole variety of different economic recovery plans. Uh, with some sort of uh, hazard pay concept. Um, that would be work that would happen in the committee that I s currently sit on, which is the House Economic and Com uh, sorry, Commerce and Economic Development Committee. Um, 
the governor's uh, launch this week uh, of his economic recovery package recommendation was uh, he recommended uh, 310 million in immediate relief with a second phase of estimated around 90 million. And then on top of that, an additional uh, 50 million to uh, target um, supports for the dairy industry, which has been in free fall uh, during the COVID uh, period, but also a slower slide for many years. Um, and just as things were starting to rebound a little bit, uh, the COVID crisis hit and demand dropped and uh, the dairy industry is uh, suffering considerably. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Emily, I'll just, I did see that. And um, <laughs> I, it's, it's okay, I know it was not for the public, but I, I wanted to just say that there are some interesting conversations about what we can do next on the hazard pay. And I think that that's going to be potentially within the context of the total package, which is why I said that, but I don't, I don't know. Um, and um, didn't mean to talk across the circle there, but I was trying to connect the two. Uh, the, um, the economic recovery package, I think probably the part that most excites me um, is his proposal around uh, emergency grants for food, accommodation, retail, and agriculture. And um, that he's recommending $150 million. And uh, I'm not actually sure that that will be enough. Um, the, the hospitality sector uh, is a huge uh, economic driver in Vermont in a tourist economy, but also a kind of a driver of what it means to live in community and also carries a lot of the, the weight of, of the folks who are on UI, um, many of whom have restaurant or hospitality related jobs. And the problem for that sector in particular, and I think this is uh, crucial for people to know, is that the federal programs, particularly the payroll protection plan, um, many of them have applied for those monies, but they are afraid to spend them. They're weighing sending them back. And, and the reason for that is that um, in order for that to be a grant, they have to bring all of their employees back. But no one knows what uh, level of economic activity that they're, they're going to be able to operate at in, in this summer season with limited outdoor, with limited seating capacities, with all of the, the kind of the hurdles in the way. And so bringing back your entire pre-COVID payroll with the possibility of, you know, say a quarter or half of your seating capacity or your sales volume is a really fast way to go out of business, um, even if that money is free. And so that's that's the conundrum that this sector faces is that that it's unlikely that they'll be able to operate with with at full capacity and therefore the payroll protection plan is um, really um, probably unusable for them unless the feds change the rules around it. And so this emergency grant program is designed to provide cash flow for rent, mortgage, utilities, maintaining inventory, and other essential operating expenses. And, um, and there, the, the craft brewers, the uh, restaurants, you know, they all need access to this cash flow really, really quickly, like in the next couple of weeks, or we could see um, a really a complete upending of um, major parts of our economy. And I'll, so, there's housing stuff in there. We'll pivot to that in a minute, but I just wanted, I, I saw Emily unmuted. I wasn't sure if you wanted to comment and I wanna see if there's any questions around that piece. Um, I've had some really good conversations in the last week with both the Women's Caucus that Molly's the chair of um, and the Workers Caucus about how we can ensure that these packages of grants and loans that we are sending out directly to businesses that the money is used to improve the lives of the folks who work at those businesses. Yes. Um, because the, from my perspective, the only point in sustaining an economy is so that the people who live in that economy can thrive. Um, so really 
want to make sure that we're using this opportunity to um, a sort of a carrot for socially responsible business. Um, it's a rare opportunity to have, and I want to make sure that we use it well. And it's been um, reassuring to see some people come together around that conversation. Yep. And the, and two things. One is that um, sort of building off of that, Emily, um, the, the, my accidental crosstalk there that I named was that there is, um, I've seen uh, an idea floating around of, of combining that hazard, some aspects of what was the hazard pay bill that the Senate passed uh, with, uh, with the um, money that might go to employers and trying to sort of shift the responsibility of supporting employees to the employers in some interesting ways so that they might access these emergency funds, but that that would include um, making a, a big economic difference in the, the actual lived experience of their employees, as well as propping up their business operations. Um, Millicent asked me to repeat the eligibility. The 150 million is targeted at food and accommodation services, retail and agriculture. And I should say, and I didn't say this at the outset, um, the governor, has presented this in the form of a PowerPoint, but there's not much actual legal language along with it yet. Um, that's coming next week. And so uh, there, this is uh, where this, the, the legislature really has uh, some crucial work ahead um, because we ultimately will decide the rules and the parameters and, and frankly, the scale of this. Uh, and, and I do think that there's, strong intention to work collaboratively with the governor on this so that whatever we land on is likely to be something that the governor can embrace and support so that we are fast tracking the access to these resources. Um, but we need to understand all of the mechanisms to understand whether it's designed for equity. As Emily said, you know, is it going to reach the right people? Um, it's important to save these businesses and to keep them viable. It's also important to uh, recognize that you know, if the business is saved, but the people who work for it are financially ruined um, and can't afford to work for the businesses, you know, in the long run that we're opening up a whole other can of worms. So we, I, I do think there's a, a good body of work ahead of us in the next week or two on this. I see Daniel and Molly. So let's take Daniel's question, Molly, and then I'll circle back to you. Okay. I was wondering whether or not um, it would be appropriate for arts sector um, organizations to be part of the, the group that's, you know, eligible to receive these grants. You know, I'm thinking about like places like the Stone Church and the Music Center and, um, you know, wondering how, how the economic recovery plan is kind of addressing their concerns. You know, they're going to, yep. they're on a long road back. And so I didn't mention this. Uh, I highlighted one piece. There's 80 million, um, in a separate disaster loan and grant program targeted at all businesses and nonprofits, and then an additional 20 million targeted at micro and small businesses and nonprofits under 1 million in revenue. So there's and, three major buckets and, and they are aware that the nonprofit and art sectors are important targets. Go ahead, Molly. Oh, I was just going to say, and I was going to say something else, but before your question, but, you know, the Vermont Creative Network is working collaboratively through the Arts Council with the governor's economic mitigation team. So they are very involved. And I don't know if you know, but there were this, a bunch of grants that went out um, that were distributed through the Arts Council for specifically for arts businesses that were being impacted by COVID. So um, you can go on the Arts Council page, or maybe Sarah knows about it, this, but anyway. Um, and I was just going to say, in, in relation to what Emily and Tristan were talking about in the hazard pay, is that majority of the people um, who are on the front lines engage, uh, being uh, exposed to hazards are women. And so that's a, the, the Vermont Commission on Women has, uh, we had a, a presentation by the, the um, the head of the Vermont Commission on Women on that and how do we specifically address that and recognize that. So that's a, a, you know, sort of another layer in terms of when we're thinking about equity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. And uh, the, um, 
I think I'll pivot to the to the housing now, but I just wanted to say that this this is a uh, a big use of the federal relief funds, and it's clearly needed. It's clearly um, a very very time sensitive uh, piece of work, and and um, hopefully we maintain you know, the, the shared perspective between the administration and the legislature so that we move very, very quickly. But there may be points of disagreement um, that emerge or subtleties that we offer that the governor may not have preferred um, us to offer. So we'll see how that shapes up. But I think the clear priority is to get this into action as fast as possible because we know that our community uh, businesses and employees uh, need access to these extra resources, extra supports, um, super important. Um, and it's that, far from all the money. So that's right. there's still an enormous amount more federal money that's on the table that we need to pick up. And so um, housing and broadband are two of those yep. spots. Yep, and then um, so the housing, recommendation is 50 million um, in the short term uh, from the governor and that was 42 million in a rental housing stabilization fund which would provide up to three months of emergency rental assistance and arrearage payments to property owners who have been not being paid so that would hopefully prevent evictions and uh, prevent a surge in homelessness um, the uh, Second component of that is a rehousing fund uh, to make um, its rehab grants and forgivable loans to make up to 250 units of housing available to rehouse homeless families experiencing homelessness during the outbreak. So those are the governor's initial ideas and, and um, our house committee has been working on a lot of different thinking around this for the last few months and I'm sure the Senate has as well. Um, I know professionally that this this area falls heavily within Emily's professional expertise, and I just wonder if you have any extra layers and, and details you'd like to add. Yeah, I've been working with a team of folks um, around Wyndham County who are looking at this issue from both the service provider perspective and the economic development perspective. Um, and so the proposals that have already come out, I just want to name a few things about them. One, it's really important that we have, you know, cash on hand that we are able to use to keep people already housed. It's the cheapest way to, um, and the most stable way to make sure that people aren't homeless is, you know, making sure people continue paying rent. It's going to be really important to me and I think a number of other providers in our county and other counties that that money flows through existing mechanisms that are already doing exactly this work every day. Um, Daniel, I think, knows quite a bit about this as well, because the community actions are one of the main places that the money flows. And so making sure that we are not um, wasting any of that funding by setting up whole new delivery mechanisms and whole new processes, because we actually have a system that works fairly well to do this, it just never has enough money in it. And so making sure that that is funded um, will be really important. And then the housing rehab money is useful. It is um, much more useful to counties other than Wyndham and Chittenden County. Um, there are areas of the state that have significant portions of housing that is unlivable um, and that that would be the most effective way to solve their housing challenges in those communities. That is not as true in Wyndham County. I'm not saying that there aren't units in Wyndham County that need rehab. I absolutely know that there are. And I know that, you know, the recent work by our select board here in Brattleboro to really start ramping up the housing inspections has um, shown that even more clearly to those of us who haven't um, been to some of those units personally or tried to rent some of those units personally. However, in order to solve the significant housing challenges that we have in Wyndham County and specifically Brattleboro, we're gonna need new construction. Um, and there is no one working in the housing world that doesn't know that. Um, and we've done tremendous, beautiful work as a community with federal COVID funds to make sure that everyone who didn't have housing now has a bed to sleep in and a door to close at night in a motel. And that is an incredible success. 
that we can't lose. And it's already starting to drift away a little bit. And I'm very aware of that. Um, and the housing community put together a very comprehensive letter to House and Senate leadership and the governor's office spelling that out exactly. We have an opportunity to really keep people in that stable motel housing with wraparound services um, for a number of years. And that while we build that permanent housing, because the rehab housing is not gonna solve the problem here. It will make the tiniest of dents. And so really hoping and we'll be working for part of that, part of the housing funds that we appropriate to be sent to communities to solve the problem as meets the needs of those communities, knowing that Chittenden and Wyndham County have different needs than Rutland County does, and so we need to spend our money differently. And for us here in Wyndham County, that means buying a property and needing to buy that property before January 1st, so that, because that's when the COVID funds expire, um, so that we can keep people housed in the interim in transitional housing while we um, really do sort of the bonding and longer term work that Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust is so good at. And perhaps even the private um, sector might be interested in. Thank you. Any yeah. questions or comments? <laughs> Daniel. I love raising my hand virtually. Uh, it's so, very fun, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I really appreciate the the support, uh, at least that I heard from you, Emily, and I'm presuming that Tristan and Molly concur as well. Um, and the level of you know experience and knowledge of that system that you bring to your work in the state house. And I just I hope that as a community we can get behind, um, you know, really really grabbing this opportunity to not allow ourselves to go back to the old normal of people, you know, struggling to find a place to sleep each night, struggling to meet their basic needs each day. And, you know, as we know in Brattleboro for the last several years, this has been like a hot button topic. And we, you know, we really do have this wonderful opportunity here. And as you said, it is already starting to slip away somewhat. So I, I'm not really speaking to you three, it's, I think that, that the community at large needs to understand that there is a moment here and that we need to embrace it. Um, and I also know that things are not, this is not an easy lift, um, but certainly I would, I would expect large numbers of people in Brattleboro to, to get behind this. And if, if there's a direction that we can um, direct our uh, pressure or words of support, then please let me know. I'm presuming, you know, the governor's office wouldn't be a bad place to, to start. So I see Mike. Molly and then Oscar. Um, just on that same, to oh, on that same topic um, about this is a moment. I think this is a moment for so many things. It's exposing, you know, the, the lack of health care, the lack of, of, of um, child care, the lack of paid family leave, so many things. And not to mention the fact that, you know, carbon emissions are way down worldwide because people are not flying and, and doing, you know, driving cars that much. So how do we sort of see that a lot of these issues that we've been trying to do are, had became immediately solvable, but only by shutting down our economy. So how do we sort of think about that in the really big picture? And so I just think it's, it's, you, you bring up a really important, important point. And uh, I just wanted to, and I just wanted to say that in, in the Women's Caucus, we heard not only presentation by the commissioner, uh, the Vermont Commission on Women, or not the commissioner, but the head of the Vermont Commission on Women, but also by a, uh, uh, an economist from UVM who is talking, you know, urging us to raise taxes, don't do austerity budgeting in this time. The best thing to do is invest in people. Your economy will recover much faster if you do that. And it's sort of uh, certainly like um, just completely unthinkable that even though we don't have to, that the Vermont legislature would not balance our budget. But you know, we might be able to consider raising taxes on some people and thinking in a in a big way about solving these problems as not only an investment in making things more equitable, but also helping our economy recover faster. 
Thank you. And I, I will offer on top of that comment, actually, that um, that as the governor has gotten ready to submit uh, a budget, the legislature has been waiting for the governor to revise uh, the budget suggestion uh, to create a new starting point for the what I said is a first quarter budget, which would get us until August or so, and then we would come back and do uh, a budget for the rest of the year after we have a clearer sense of the landscape, both of the federal resources and also the revenue picture and, and the degree to which our economy is recovering. Um, the governor's initial foray into that was not very detailed um, and we're waiting for more information. Um, but what I think is really important that what Molly said is that, you know, or sort of hinted at is that um, already the forces are out there, the political forces are out there starting to say this is the time to 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 shrink government you know we don't we don't have the resources to spend here um but you know and so the governor i think effectively proposed an eight percent across the board cut to the state budget um given the outsized role that the state of Vermont plays in Vermont's tiny little economy, an 8% cut in our budget is actually a pretty significant impact on the economy in and of itself. After um, a debate of 8% cuts year after year, after, right? Yeah. Like this is not, yeah. there's le little left to cut. And, and, and um, an across the board cut means that, you know, it's sort of, it, it pretends that it's socializing the harm, but in fact, it's actually, um, really greatly magnifying the harm to do an across the board cut as opposed to thinking about where and how um, those cuts should should be evaluated um, against each other to to if if we were to cut um, how to cut in a way that that produces the least harm um, is a crucial question and so it was um, I feel intellectually feel you know sort of lazy or um, <laughs> operationally lazy of the governor to to propose such a sort of draconian approach um at the very least i'm you know it's not a surprise that i stand in opposition to our governor's thinking as a liberal windham county democrat um with, against a, a, a republican governor but the fact is that we're heading into election season and and he has decided clearly decided strategically that it that um, he is going to run both on his COVID response and sort of responsiveness to the business community and bring back his fiscal conservatism. And we saw that echoed in the floor debates in the House in the last week on sort of side issues, but where the House Republicans were starting to say, why are we spending this money? Why are we spending this money? Um, and you know these aren't normal times. We shouldn't be spending money. And, and again, if if we we now are in a place where the political dynamics are shifting, and we are going to be having a conversation about whether um, to retreat and and shrink our response or whether to uh, engage fully. And and that whole thread back to what we were just talking about the housing situation and homelessness is like we if we shrink. If we shrink at the community level in the face of an opportunity to, to make transformational investments, we miss, we miss, and we will be perpetually going to be having to pay for the consequences of that and try to come back to it. If we do the same thing at the state level, we miss, and we will be perpetually paying for that. And so these are crucial times. And I apologize, I just remembered that Oscar had signaled his hand, uh, I believe, uh, had waved to us, and I will step back and let you jump into our space. Okay, thank you. Um, just a, a question from someone who about going back to housing for Molly or Daniel or whoever, someone who knows much less about the subject. When you talk about there being a moment, is there a specific outcome or policy that you see and that, that you've been hoping for that you see a specific opportunity to make progress on? Or is it more of a general mm -hmm. moment in, in terms of people are paying attention and maybe there would be sort of money and public support available? Oh, so there's um, there's a long-standing state program um, called um, General Assistance Housing, and that program is designed because someone froze to death 
on the street once. And um, the idea is to just, is essentially to keep people from freezing to death on the street. And so the program provides um, state funds for motel housing on a very, very short term basis when the weather is bad. And it's generally determined on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes on a week-to-week -week basis, depending on how high risk a population someone is, um, both health, age, family composition, a few other things. Time is, the time is sometimes extended out a little bit, but it's very tenuous um, and not available in certain seasons at all. Um, and so, and um, it's paying people to live in sort of random motel rooms. Um, and so because of the public, the clear public health risk, um, GA housing was extended to, eligibility was extended significantly to anyone who did not, um, anyone who is in um, congregate housing. So folks who are staying at the Groundworks Overflow Shelter um, or other sort of options like that throughout the state so that everyone could have the privacy of sort of a hygienic bubble, essentially. Um, and so a lot of people who historically have not felt safe staying in congregate housing um, were, and have, you know, were sleeping in cars or um, other places were able to also access this privacy and stability of having a bed and a door. And there were services provided by a number of community partners, primarily Groundworks, um, to support the folks and make sure that the folks who were living in motels and didn't necessarily have kitchens could get, how, could get you know, food services and um, get connected to sort of the rest of the pipeline that leads to a stable apartment or house. Um, we have an opportunity now because everyone is sort of in one place and um, connected to services and has that privacy and stability to you know, take next steps in their lives to um, maintain that service. And so it's clearly not the most financially efficient thing to continue to pay you know, a collection of motels their nightly rate with state dollars. Um, the money has been coming out of federal funds through the COVID funds. And so how can we take that COVID funding that's left to us through December 31st and use that to create the same kind of stable housing that we have right now with people staying in motels. And so we're talking about how can we, um, can the community perhaps buy a motel um, itself um, or another campus of some sort that has that kind of um, efficiency apartment kind of vibe for people to live in in a transitional capacity while, they're, um, while we're waiting for more housing, more um, full housing and stable housing to be available. And it's a clear opportunity in that we have the federal funds that need to be spent quickly to purchase something. Um, that's a real opportunity. And that we have um, ongoing funding for wraparound services that we have not actually been using as fully as we could have and have actually sent some money back a few times because we didn't um, have the capacity for those wraparound services previously. And so that's the, that's the moment in time I'm talking about. It's the magic of having everyone housed and safe with a door um, and the opportunity of all of this federal funding that's available and has to be spent quickly and can't be used for ongoing um, appropriations. So the idea is we'd use the one time, presumably next, next round or current round of, of federal funding to make the purchase and then but then it would exist as an ongoing program? Yes, it would be um, use this round of funding, okay. actually, um, and is, possibly. Is the uh, idea that the town of Brattleboro would be the owner of the no, I don't housing, think or it would be some sort of nonprofit? Yeah, it would probably be like, you know, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust or Groundworks or somewhere like that. It would be in some ways a lot like our seasonal overflow shelter, but um, with doors and beds and stability. And when, when do you think, how long do you think the moment lasts? Is there a, a The deadline's December 31st. Okay. And um, in order to close a deal, you need to start pretty soon. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Tony? I was, yeah, sorry, thank Tristan? you. No, no, Tony. Okay. Um, am I, okay. Um, yeah. You said something about private 
um, also when you were talking before, um, and I just immediately went to like section eight funding or something. Is there something about using money for, you know, housing people in existing, you know, private housing? We have no housing stock. We have the lowest vacancy rate in the state and it's one of the lowest vacancy rates in the country. Um, we might, we have, there are a number of people on a daily basis in Wyndham County and Brattleboro specifically who have housing vouchers to pay for their housing who can't find housing and in fact have to give the vouchers back because of the incredible shortage we have. There are opportunities to expand that in the short term and that's what some of that housing rehab money is for. Um, or folks who might be using Airbnb right now and tourism has dropped, but um, that's not gonna come anywhere close to filling the need that we have. Daniel? Yeah, I, you know, I think the moment for me, it's, you know, I'm really glad to hear all that detail and I don't wanna get into like what the right policy is. I think it's a moral moment. You know, we have housed over 120 individuals, many families um, during this moment where they needed to stay safe. And how can we as a community just say, no, it's okay, we'll let them drift out back to wherever. And you know, not only have we housed them and kept them safe and healthy, but they've then had the opportunity to connect with services in a consistent way, mm -hmm. which surely gives them a much greater foundation to build upon and be able to move towards having stable permanent housing. And I think as a community, we cannot allow ourselves to just drift back to the old normal. Thank you for adding that. Sometimes lately I find myself so lost in like the political logistics of things that I um, forget to say the moral moment out loud because that is absolutely the driver behind all of this work. Did you see Oscar asked a couple of questions on um, on what are the next steps that people can take to help make that happen and who's taking the lead and how can people plug in? Um, there's a group of folks that came together um, on the town level. You could connect to the planning office um, and they're sort of leading that. Um, Groundworks is working on it, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. Um, there's a letter that's floating around that Bob just was the most recent person to have sent me um, that maybe he wants to link into the chat as well. Um, that would be um, sort of following up on the recommendations of that letter and um, continuing to share that letter, I think would be a really effective thing to do. Um, we might need to do some private fundraising at some point, but really the hope is that we can use federal funds on this. Um, and so if you have, you know, you know, folks in other communities that have the same need, because um, this, Matt, this moment of having everyone housed with dignity for perhaps the first time in Vermont history um, is true across the state. It's not something that just happened here. Emily, can you speak to the question that just came in about what evidence is there that this has, how this has affected people's lives in sort of ten, um, um, I don't have the data in front of me. What I will say that we have heard, um, and Bob put the letter in the chat box for anyone who wants to see it um, and click on it. You know, folks are able to eat um, much more healthy and sort of keep their, you know, physical health together, able to access medical care more easily. Kids um, are able to attend school in whatever capacity more easily and more regularly if they're sleeping in the same bed right now. Behavioral challenges are, you know, much more easeful with children that know where they're sleeping every mm -hmm. night um, because of, you know, anxiety drops significantly. Um, and what I've heard from folks who are providing services is that sort of the interpersonal challenges that crop up um, with substance use and um, behavior and whatever else when people are staying at the seasonal overflow shelter is um, quite different and quite eased when everyone has a, you know, everyone has privacy. And I'm sure, you know, that it's all common sense and it's all playing out as that common sense you would imagine. Um, 
long term, we know that um, the health consequences of um, being unstably housed are significant from, you know, we PTSD um, from chronic stress, long term physical health consequences from, you know, eating, um, violence um, against women and children and men to um, just like there's no end to the consequences and costs of folks not having stable housing. It's also like, it's impossible to maintain a job if you don't have an address. It's hard to even apply for jobs when you don't have an address. Um, just that level of stress of not knowing where you're gonna sleep. And, and this is what, yeah, to, to build off of that, I think the, there is a quite a bit of data that shows that actually the, the ideas of the housing first model of you know that that actually getting people housed right away and then providing services is a it's a very expensive if you will upfront cost but the 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 long term savings are recouped in substantial ways um but frankly this is typical of of the political diamond and dynamics of our country that we often fight about making those upfront investments that will actually transform the system. And I think that what we're holding on to right now is the hope that that these resources and this moment will allow us to make those kinds of upfront investments in in real you know real housing opportunities that will then have that tail effect of of dramatically lowering future costs. Um, and it's usually so hard to fight for the extra dollars to get invested, but now there's a, a larger pot of money that may really be available to to do this. That's important. And and Daniel, I think your your moral frame is absolutely appropriate here. You know, this is a we we have an ethical responsibility to meet this moment, um, and hopefully we can we can do so. This is going to be our big challenge in the next few weeks. Yeah. I, I did want to say one thing, which Bob's you know, hand is up. Oh, sorry, Bob. Go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. Bob, it's not. There's no sound coming out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. So presumably you'll put it in chat, um, and I'll <laughs> I'll pick it up. I'll say my quick thought, and while while Bob give Bob a chance to put his question into the chat. Um, which is just that going back to what I said about the contraction of the state government and even the significance of that, you know, I just I, grabbing from Wikipedia, nothing, nothing deeply sourced, you know, Vermont in, in normal times, the, the state budget was, was 17% of the Vermont economy. Um, and uh, if the Vermont economy is going through a major contraction, the impact of of also contracting at the state level besides the disproportionate harm that that creates um is that actually we we will we re reduce our ability to recover um and uh of course at the federal level it's even bigger impact when the when the federal government decides to contract when they should be spending um you know this is keynesian econo economics it goes back to the world war ii it, you know it's it's well tested uh empirically driven uh information but we will be fighting this at the political level um i know for the next month uh at least and then in august and september as we come back to pass a longer term budget and it will and the governor will be um, trying to find a way to signal to his Republican base that he's still a small government guy. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's, it flies in the face of what he needs to do in the post COVID response. Uh, haven't seen Bob's question come through yet. There it is. Ah, there was an interesting article in the Caledonia record to the point that housing vouchers were saving the Northeast kingdom hotels, perhaps a new model of accessible housing through the hospitality sector. Just a thought, Emily. Do you want to take that? Yeah, um, that's absolutely part of it. And I, there's actually an interesting sort of thread also about ideas about um, feeding people through the restaurant sector. That's, um, I don't know if you went to the Hunger Council yesterday, Bob, but I know that was the conversation at the Hunger Council yesterday. Um, and so I think that's an opportunity. For, that's a short term opportunity. Um, what that transitions to from there isn't clear to me um and so that's why you know 
many of the properties that we're talking about have been housing. We have a lot of motels in our area that their exclusive business model at this point is pretty much housing people on, you know, week to week um, and not for tourists. And yeah. so um, to sort of name that and own that and wrap our money around it in a different way, I think would be really helpful. We are at 10.06. Yeah, I was going to say, it feels like a good stopping point if, if there's nothing burning for other folks. I would like to name something before we, um, maybe a topic for next week. Um, we still have um, the worst rates of opiate overdoses and deaths in the state. And we still really need to come together and do something different about that. And I want to make sure that... Um, as a member of the delegation, I'm saying out loud that, you know, some crises don't change no matter what other crises come along. And that is one of them. And I'm hoping we can find ways to really step up to that challenge, um, you know, through. I wonder if we should um, invite somebody like Susie. I always get her name mixed up with somebody else. Susie Walker mm -hmm. to come on. Yeah, that would be great. Or, um, you know, Rosie, who lives in Guilford, is running the COSUP project now um, mm -hmm. after Chad left. So, yeah, that would yeah, be Yeah, it be, might be really good to have somebody like that. Mm -hmm. I would say if you if you have the ability to invite her, Emily, for next week, I'd love to hear. Okay. I'd, lo I'd think that would be wonderful. Um, so I think I will declare this a wrap then and, and thank you all again for your participation and uh, to the Brattleboro community, uh, just a reminder that all of your three representatives have publicly listed contact information. Please do reach out to us if you're continuing to struggle uh, or need our help or have some ideas for us to chew on and think about. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna stop the recording before I end the meeting. <laughs>